to move into the summer. Now last week, as we continue our study of Ruth, and I've already begun reading, preparing, and thinking about our lessons. When we finish Ruth, we're going to go into the book of Job. That's going to be interesting on a, a number of levels. And uh, it's, going to make, it's going to generate a lot of interesting discussion as we go into the book of Job. So we will we'll be doing that, probably start that sometime during this summer. But we're looking at Ruth, and Ruth chapter 3. And last week we began to talk about Ruth's, uh, and Naomi especially, Naomi's scheme to help God. Chapter 3 of the book of Ruth. One day, Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, should I not try to find a home for you where you will be well provided for? Is not Boaz with whose servant girls you have been a kinsman of ours? Tonight he will be winnowing barley on the threshing floor. Wash and perfume yourself and put on your best clothes. Then go down to the threshing floor, but don't let him know you are there until he has finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, note the place where he is lying, then go and uncover his feet and lie down, and he will tell you what to do. I will do whatever you say, Ruth answered. So she went down to the threshing floor and did everything her mother-in-law had told her. And we talked about this being a, a, a crisis on the part of uh, Ruth and Naomi, and the crisis was really, you know, how do you step up without stepping over it or stepping into it, to use a phrase that we always use nowadays. And we talked about Naomi developing a scheme to help God. And we looked at these several items that may have been prompting or motivating Naomi to, to come up with this plan. Duty. My daughter, is it not my responsibility? Should I not try to find you a home? That's her sense of duty. And perhaps there would have been some fear kind of with that, that Naomi wasn't getting any younger. Ruth wasn't getting any younger. She was a single foreign woman in a nation, in a tribe that at best was unstable. So she was afraid of what might happen to her. And then faith. It seemed like, based upon what we saw in chapter 2, that God was actually beginning to move and help Naomi. Although Naomi, for a long time, you know, had thought, you know, God's against me, nobody likes me, and all this other stuff. And now she's beginning to realize that, yes, God is on my side. God is going to help. He's going to help me. He's going to do something for me. So now I need to help God. And this is something that we often do in our lives as Christians. And the idea of how our schemes versus God's plans can at times be pivotal to our lives. You know, how often have we felt we have had to fix something because of our sense of someone else's perceptions or fears or whatever? rather than waiting on God to work it out. And even more dangerously, how often have we felt that God was on the scene, God was working, now I just need to help him. He's already here, but I need to do some more to help him. So what are some of the things that motivate us to think this way? That I need to do something to help God. We've already talked about the duty, the fear, the faith. And we could probably put fear here again. Because this happened with Saul. In 1 Samuel chapter 13. Samuel had said to Saul to wait on me to get there. And I'm going to make an offering. You're going to fight the Philistines and all this other stuff. Well, Samuel delayed and Samuel delayed. At least in Saul's mind it was. And so Saul in 1 Samuel chapter 13. And this is what he said to Samuel. That he was afraid. He saw the enemy. Samuel wasn't anywhere to be found. 
So I forced myself and went ahead and stepped into the office of a priest and prophet and made an offering. And how things can be pivotal when we want to come up with our scheme to help God. That's what he was doing. Samuel said to him, well, had you just simply believed, had you simply waited, God would have given you the victory. But now because you've not followed the Lord, he's going to look for somebody else to take your place as king. So his scheme out of fear really ended up working against him. So what are some other things that have um, motivated us or challenged us to act versus waiting on God? What are some of the things that you may have experienced in your life or you have heard of or you've read in Scripture that have come up to this? The first thing that, that strikes me is ambition because Naomi was like Rebecca. She connived to get what she wanted that would put them really in good standing. I don't know if that's connived or not. Con, I before you except after C, you know. Yeah, yeah, let me go ahead and just scratch that out as I normally write. You wouldn't be able to read that. Yeah, ambition. So ambition will lead to a conniving, and she really did. I mean, she had been split down. And she was wanting to help God. She knew that her child was the one that God had blessed. And it didn't look like that, that her husband was moving fast enough. He wasn't acting like he ought to. So she needed to take things into her own hand and come up with a scheme that cost both of her children for years and years and years as a result of that. What are some other things that that motivate us or challenge us to um, scheme to help God. God won't act soon enough as if God doesn't know the timetable. As if God doesn't understand the situation. And this we could also just. And we're really good at rationalizing everything to make it sound just like, yeah, this is what God wants. Yeah. Well, now, man, with, with you saying that, I'm still here just mm-hmm. fearful in that. Did, did these people, when they scheme, know they were scheming? Because we can rationalize mm-hmm. that. You know, that, that's scary. You know, I don't want to be in that pivotal point and say, well, I need to do this to make sure these things happen, thinking that that's what I'm supposed to do, but then mess them up. Yeah. That's huge. Yeah, it, it is. And I think Naomi did know she was skinny. Because look at the word. My daughter, should I not try to find a home? Duty. Or <clears throat> you'll be well cared for. And you can almost see it now. Is not the way. It's not Boaz. But she's looking at the circumstances and saying, what can, can we do yeah. to make sure all turns out well? What can we do to help God? Especially <clears throat> given her time frame. Because mm-hmm. now you look at it, but given when she's living and in the context, you know, in, the, in where she's living, mm-hmm. like to us, to me, it doesn't seem acceptable now. But in the period of time she's living, this is what they do. She needed to have she needed to have somebody to take care of her. Right. And this yeah. Yeah. And but wait till it gets full. Wait till it gets soft. Don't go see where it's at. Go lay down on it. Not very good. Wait the man's drunk. Yeah. Yeah. What 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 was I don't know the country singer was it Willie Nelson you know whoever it was I went to bed at two with a ten and woke up at ten with a two you know that type of thing you know. Uh, yeah, nothing's changed, honey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're doing dog. I ain't going there. Um, but circumstances, and and we have another example of this, right? Where I think people do say, you know, do we know? Do we not know? Sometimes we're we're trying to. The key to this, we got to help God. Yes, 
think that, you got, was it Tam, Tamar, Tamar? Tamar? That disguised herself as a prostitute and went and slept with her brother in law or something. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that was in God's will. And you got, I'm confused. And, and interestingly, in chapter 4, verse 12. Through the offspring the Lord gives you by this young woman, may your family be like that of Perez whom Tamar bore to Judah. That's going to be an interesting discussion. You're, you're wanting an incestuous relationship to be as wonderful, your relationship to be as wonderful as an incestuous relationship in Genesis 38. And it's full of deception. Yeah, on a lot of levels. Mm -hmm. And along with that, Genesis chapter 19, Lot. How the whole situation of, of Moab and Ammon came about after the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Lot got away. It's just he and his two daughters. They're up on the mountainside. And his daughters say, well, you know, we ain't got no husband. And daddy's in bad shape, evidently. He ain't doing too good himself. We need to have some offspring. Let's help God. So what do they do? They got Lot drunk. One daughter had sex with him that night. The next night they got him drunk again. The other daughter had sex with him. Both of them. One of the children that was born out of that is Moab. The ancestress of Moab is Root. Family Interesting. Tree's a palm tree. Sir? Family tree's a palm tree. Yeah, it looks like a telephone pole almost, doesn't it? Yeah, you know. And uh, and we <laughs> rationalize all of these things, but the key to when we're when we're wrestling with this is we're doing all this to help God. Since when does God need our help to do his will. I, you know, that's, that's one of the keys to helping us when we run into these things. Because we do. We all do as Christians. We all come up with something, uh, some situation, some circumstance, and we feel like, okay, God's on the scene here, but, you know, he just really is not acting fast enough. He's really just not doing what I want done. Bless God, I need to step up and do something to help him rather than simply waiting trusting and asking what do you want me to do now we could say we assume we could assume that Naomi had prayed and asked God for this and he God get this but it's not in him and you look at what she was offering mm, kind of a sketchy plan coming from the hand of God Impatience, which was, yeah, ambition. Impatience could go along with this as another one. Billy, this poses a hard question yeah. for, me, for me especially. Yeah, for all of us. Because God Christians. makes you where, but given, so God made me, and this is how I am. If I, it's like a checklist. If something comes up, I have to do it, and I have to get it done then, because then it starts snowballing. So then you pray, and you sit back, but like with me, Things, to, some things to other people are so insurmountable. I'm like, no, just do it, just do it. So how do you know, like, when these things come in front of you, and I just look at them like, no, in five minutes, you can solve that, solve that, and move on to the next problem. But if that's how God made me, that's how I just do it. Move that on and go on. That's not a problem, I'll handle it, go on. So how do you know, and as I got older, like, you know, I sit around a lot, and I think I'm waiting on God's patience, but you know what, it's not. I know what to do. I'm just so tired of fooling these people. I just sit there. So that's not Christian either. So, you know, it's like a rock in a hard place, but then God made me like that. So I'm thinking if something comes in front of you, it's easy. You should just solve it and move on. You make me tired. Imagine this poor man that has to live with me. Bless his heart. Yeah. Yeah, you know, he's not said a word. That's a wise man sitting there like that. Yeah. But you know what I mean? And God makes people that sit yeah. around and Well, and, and I think I think you bring up a totally legitimate point because we all have our own individual personalities and our ways of approaching, dealing with situations. 
and we then can rationalize, this is how God made me. So bless God, I'm gonna step up and do it. Lord, you take care of the mess I'm making, you know. Lord, you know how I am, so I'm, you know. And we've all done that. I've, I've done that. I haven't said it exactly like that, but I may as well have, you know. I got another thing, Bill. Uh -huh. uh, is, we always say that God works through his people. Mm -hmm. And uh, how do you know that you're not called on to do or take action or do something? So it's, yeah. it's sort of ambiguous about the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. and, and we're going we're gonna to look at several suggestions. When I, and when I say that suggestion, several things to think about in, in coming up with how do we relate to whatever situation, whether it's a snap situation or whether it's something that is maybe more long term that we need to look at and do we need to help God? Do we need to wait on God? What does God want me to do? There are several things that we can think about with this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You're, yeah. You get, if, if we ever get it that clear, we have a pretty good idea. Of course, even Moses at that point standing in front of the burning bush saying, Lord, you don't really don't want me to do this because I can't talk and I can't, you know. Hope would probably put it out. Yeah. Yeah. You know. Because <laughs> yeah, Hope would put the thing out. He's 911. We need a fire truck out here. You know. <laughs> But, but all of these things, impatience, you know, when Moses was up on the mount, getting the Ten Commandments, down at the bottom of the mountain, the children of Israel were saying, where's Moses? I don't know. He's up on the mountain. Been, he's been gone for 40 days. I don't know what we need our God to worship. Impatience. And they created a golden calf. Good scheme. Bad result. And a lot of times we come up with good schemes that end up giving us a bad result. And we thought, rationalize, we thought we were trying to help God. As if God really needs a lot of help. You know, he can't do anything on his own. It's only that nothing is impossible with him, so he needs our help. You know. But these things happen to us. And the impact of faith. You know, Naomi was beginning to see the Almighty hadn't just brought misfortune on her. But if you see that God is working for you, what is leading you to think that you have to help Him? Especially in ways that could just as easily backfire as succeed. And there's a difference between trusting in a direction that has been brought to you by God. 1 Kings chapter 17, verses 1 through 6. The Lord had told Elijah, now I want you to tell everybody and announce that for the next three years, there's not going to be any rain. Now after you do that, I want you to go by the brook. And I have ordered the ravens, which by the way, is a carrion feeder, just like a vulture, they will come feed you. How'd you like to have that three times a day? A bird that feeds on carrion bringing you the groceries you're gonna eat. That took a lot of faith. <laughs> it would for me anyway. And a, and a strong stomach, I would think. No hand sanitizer. And no hand sanitizer, you know. <laughs> but this was a direction that God gave him and Elijah didn't question it. But there's a difference between trusting in a direction that has been brought to you by God and concocting a plan based on, on a misguided faith that God is with you. And a perfect example of this is 1 Samuel chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. Israel again, fighting the Philistines. They had been defeated. They're getting ready to fight again. So, they come up with this great idea. We'll go get the ark. And we'll go fight this crowd with the ark of God. So when we bring out our relic, when we bring out our rabbit's foot, you know, 
and the ark will go before us, we'll win the battle. And they all shouted and everything, and you know, the enemy camp heard them shouting because the ark was there, and they thought, oh, what is this going to be? And they were encouraged, go fight, go fight. And Israel lost. And the ark was taken. They had a misguided faith that led to a scheme. Let's go get the ark and bring it out here. It ain't about the box. It was about your obedience to the God of the box. The power wasn't in the ark. The power was in the God of the ark. They thought if they just had the ark, it'd be fine, regardless of how they were living or whether they were following God or not. But if they had the ark, see, that was their scheme. And it totally backfired. Now, out of Naomi's sense of duty and a failure of patience on her part, through her trust in God, being a little misguided at this point, she hatches a scheme to force the hand of Boaz. And it's divided into two sections, these, these several verses. The first, she presents the facts of the case. She's telling Ruth, you and Boaz have a standing acquaintance with whose servant girls you have been. She's been working for Boaz now for about three months, maybe a little over. And another fact, he is a kinsman of ours. A third fact, tonight he will be winnowing barley on the threshing floor. So in Naomi's mind, her duty was pushing her to look for an opportunity to obtain this home, Boaz's house, for Ruth. And she comes up with this plan now. Now here are the facts. Yeah, you've been working with him. He knows you. He's complimented you. He gave us, he's given us, you know, enough enough sustenance to last us maybe a year by this point. And he's a near kinsman, so he can take, he can marry you. So here's the plan. And when you read that, you just automatically wonder, what in the world were you really thinking, Naomi? Because here's the plan. Go wash and use perfumed olive oil, which was what they would have used, and put on an outer garment that is acceptable, not just your work clothes. And some commentators note that the clothes that Naomi wanted Ruth to put on were not the garments of her widowhood either because she would have come back to Israel from Moab with garments that noted that she was a widow. And of course, as long as she wore these garments, that could have been the reason that Boaz didn't push the issue. He may have figured that she was still mourning the loss of her husband. We don't know. We don't know. But some commentators will note that when she told her to change clothes, she was telling her, don't put on something that says you're a widow and you're still in the morning because people will leave you alone. No, we want you to put out I'm, I'm available clothes. Use our own language today. And then she says, now, hi. But watch where Boaz is. Now, after he's party and he's celebrated the harvest, and he goes and lays down. You know where he is. You stay hidden now. You don't, he doesn't need to see you. And then you go and uncover his legs, and you lie down, and he'll tell you what to do. Now, how much sense does that really make to you? Just hearing that, really. Is that normal? Huh? Is that normal? No! <laughs> no! California completely Yeah, yeah. Yeah, now, California, hey, you know. Maybe a couple of other states on the West Coast there, too, that would be, you know, acceptable. But nowhere in Scripture is this prescription given for what is called a Levirate marriage situation. In other words, where there's a relative that marries the widow of another relative. Now, this was possibly the way they interpreted how to begin this Levirate process, but there is nowhere in the Old Testament that the Lord says, this is how you go and present a proposal of marriage. 
Evidently, Naomi was assuming, thinking, that by Ruth doing these things, Boaz would recognize Ruth's readiness for the next step and that he would positively respond. And that's a good rationalization. But let's think about that for just a little bit more. Out of all that we've already looked at here. Ruth was who? A Moabite. And we've already talked about how the Moabites came about from an incestuous relationship with the daughter and her dad. Genesis 19, verses 30 through 38. And now Naomi is telling her to follow the very same steps her ancestors used up to a point and that currently a prostitute would have followed to take advantage of a profitable harvest. Prostitution. When the harvest has come in and the sugar daddies are loaded, it was time for the women to step up. You go there in the parties going on. Make a living. And they would have perfumed themselves. They would have changed their clothes. They would have come on the scene at night so that they wouldn't be recognized. Naomi is suggesting to Ruth to follow the same example. Did she really mean for her to be a prophet? No. But that's what it's looking like. And you come to the floor at night with darkness as a disguise. By the way, Ruth, don't let anybody see you come or go. And then Ruth was to actually act in a way that was strongly suggestive to a man who had this happen while he was sleeping. She didn't come to him while he was awake. The man is asleep. She uncovers his legs. Now, the Hebrew word for uncover his feet is used for the lower limbs. Now, in a lot of places, and in that day, that word meant lower limbs all the way up to the genitals. There are other places in Scripture that it is meaning the actual lower limbs, like knee down. We have to assume, and I think it's a good assumption, that Naomi was wanting her to uncover his legs up to his knees. Not to expose him all the way. We have to assume that. That a true sexual encounter wasn't what either woman was looking for. But then Ruth was going to, is supposed to lay down and see what he would do. See any problems with that? I mean, it's not good. this plan, I don't think I can look no, I, you know, <laughs> did she do that? The Holy Spirit inspired the writer to the book to say, yeah, you can't fix it. This is how some people plan. So me and Pope can talk right there. <laughs> I ain't saying nothing. <laughs> well, we've all come up with plans that if we look back on them now and we talked to, and we were honest, probably sounded about as risky, maybe even as risque as what we have in Ruth chapter 3. So what could possibly have gone wrong with this plan? Let's just think about it a little bit. Let's say a whole lot about his character. Again, more about his character that he didn't take advantage of mm -hmm. the situation. Because, I mean, he's intoxicated. He, he's groggy from being sleepy, and she's there. I mean, that, that's impressive. That's a, pretty, that's a pretty good guy. Yeah. I mean, you know. That's a lucky trap, <laughs> yeah. if, she, if she'd been working for the FBI, it'd have been a real sting operation. They wouldn't, you know. Both wanted to attract this good man, both Ruth and Naomi, and let him know that Ruth was ready for marriage. But you had to go through all of this to come up and say that to him? 
Some of the problems. Ruth could have chickened out, not followed through. Which, you, you know, might have been a very sensible way at that point to think about it. You know, think about walking over there. This is crazy. Man, my mom-in-law is... Some of, that, some of that dementia is setting in on her or something. She's getting old. This, this, I ain't new. No, I ain't going to do this. And it would have backfired. Or, based upon her history and her, her tribe's history, her national history of Moab, she could have said, well, I'm going this far. May as well finish it out and go too far. It could have been that someone could have seen Ruth. You know, she's traveling. She's going there. She's all decked out, you know, and whatever. She wasn't, she wasn't primp, but she had changed clothes. She had a different appearance. And it could have been that someone had seen Ruth, assuming she's headed to the threshing floor, headed to the area. This is a prostitute and forcing her to have sex and throwing some money at her and saying, go ahead, go on back to business. That could have been a problem. Boaz being a little too happy from the harvest and thinking, because he didn't know. When he woke up, he didn't know this was Ruth. He could have woke, woke up a little groggy, maybe a little happy, seeing this woman laid out there, his legs uncovered, and thinking she was a prostitute, took her up on it, offered or he could have said, because he was a good man, he could have called for somebody to come and take this woman and throw her out of here. Any one of those would have been just as likely a result of this scheme that they hatched up, particularly Naomi hatched up. And any of these type of other results would have produced something totally un unwanted, unplanned for and would have ruined the whole thing. How often do, I, do we allow our sense of crisis to drive our responses, plans, and decisions which to us look good in our mind but are just as fraught with pitfalls that we never intend on happening. We're all guilty of doing this to some degree or other. Maybe not quite to the level of potential disaster that Naomi and Ruth hatched up, but nonetheless, we all have made plans to help God and to our minds really looked and sounded good until it actually began to unfold and all of a sudden it just didn't go like we planned and now we're really looking to God to help us out of the mess we created. So what are some guidelines that can help us here? And I think there are several that give us some, some general things to think about. When we reach that place of crisis, when we reach that place that we need to help God, we think, and we're, we're motivated to come up with a scheme slash plan. First guideline. Look at the situation with reason, sense, and knowledge of God, but not emotion. It's when we allow our feelings to overrule our knowledge that we often choose to act and more often than not act in a way that doesn't honor God. We've already noted, Naomi had a sense of duty, a sense of fear. These are legitimate, but at the same time, the emotions of all this led her to come up with a scheme that it's only by the sheer mercy and grace of God just didn't blow up right in her face. And do we really want to just always depend on the sheer mercy and the grace of God to keep something from blowing up in our face? When, if we would take some time to set the emotion aside, not that it's easy, not that it's easy, but once again, 
when we're looking at something that could potentially go just as bad as it could go good, looking at it from the standpoint of reason and sense, common sense, common sense next to the grace of God is one of the greatest things in the world. But not emotion. Second thing, ask yourself a question. As you come up with your scheme, let's go ahead and put our, you know, our positive spin, it's our plan. This is my plan. God may be looking at it and say, good grief, you're scheming like crazy. Second thing to think about today, ask yourself a question. What will honor God the most in the situation? Sometimes it is a weighing of what is good and best, not good and evil, but what is good and best in our responses to situations. If we must act, and there are times that we do, if we must act, what will honor him the most should drive the direction and the nature of our response. Who will get the most benefit from our scheme, us or God? An example of this is Gehazi in 2 Kings chapter 5. Remember, Naaman had come to Elisha, and Elisha had told him what to do for God to heal him. He did it. He comes back to Elisha, and he wants to just reward Elisha. Elisha says, no, I don't want your money. Go back home. Gehazi, Elisha's servant, says, are you nuts? This man has got money. And we need some of that money. Gehazi hatches a plan. He says, I'm going to get some. He pursues, unknown to Elisha, he pursues Naaman. Naaman sees him, you know, coming. He stops and says, okay, what's up? He said, well, my master has some people that are coming, and we just like a, a, a talent of silver and a couple of changes of clothes. He said, oh, man, go on, take all you need. And he just loads him up. Yeah, he's like, feeling pretty good about all this. He gets back to life. He said, what you been up to? He said, oh, I ain't been doing nothing. He said, yeah, yeah. And as a result of what you've done, because of your plan and your scheme, you were the one that's going to benefit from that, not God. And now the leprosy that was on Naaman is going to cling to you the rest of your life. And Gehazi left the presence of Elisha leprous. What's going to honor God the most in the schemes and the plans we develop? You know, and if we have to act, this is something that can help us really come up with a plan to come up with, if we feel like we've got to help God, to come up with a plan that may actually be honoring God. Third thing, don't disobey what you know God wants to do what you want. Don't disobey what you know God wants to do what you want. There are times in which we see and we think what God is directing us for and instead of following him, we force the issue and fail to obey. Go back to 1 Samuel chapter 13 with Saul. He knew what God wanted him to do, but because of his own fear, his own impatience, his own rationalization, he went ahead and come up with a plan to do something different. And the consequence was pivotal in his life. He lost the anointing of God for his kingship from that point on. Fourth thing. How does waiting in faith versus action impact the situation? In other words, when the plan is do something versus faith, the better plan is faith. Now we're going to actually see this because interestingly, we're not going to get to it, but I'm going to go to the verse. Interestingly, in verse 18, chapter 3, 
after all this scheme to help God, to force the issue, look at what Naomi says. Wait. Wait, my daughter, until you find out what happens. Really? That's what you needed to do to begin with. Is wait. Faith. No, I got to do something. I got to do something. Then after you do something, you go back to the, well, we need to wait to see what God's going to do now. I feel good about what I did. Now, God, it's your turn. When waiting was what she needed to do to begin with, God knew what he was going to do. He brought them together to begin with. In chapter 2, could he not now link them up together? Sure he could. How does waiting in faith versus action impact the situation? If you're going to have to end up waiting anyhow, why not wait on the front end while you know you're doing exactly what God wants you to do? You go find somebody and uncover his legs and see what happens, you know. Uh, yeah. I mean, yeah, that, that's a good rationalization on that commercial, you know. The, the good thing, though, there's a lot of interesting words on the board there. And, and um, the one good thing is, is God knows everything and he knows our heart. And he knows, I think, if we're, if we're trying to do something for good, because if you think about it, you look, you look at your kids, and, and he's our, our Heavenly Father, but you look at your kids, and when you come home and the garbage has been taken out and nobody's told them, you kind of proud. So you want to make your parents proud, so you took the garbage out. Now you might have left a sink full of dirty, rotten dishes, and, mm -hmm. but, you know, oh, but we, we get it. We, we appreciate that. And I think we might look at that in the same way and I'm rationalizing a little bit. But, mm -hmm. you know... Um, we're, we're, we're not doing it to, to help God maybe as much as, you know, we've got the incentive and we're trying to make you proud that we're trying to do what we think you would like for us to do. Um, and, the, and these things that I'm giving you will help you to do that exactly. in a way that doesn't put you in a place to where Ruth could have been kicked out of the whole town right. as a result of this. And, and then, too, he, he, or also, he also knows our heart. knows everything that's happened and everything that's going to happen so then you kind of step back and say yeah I knew Ted was going to do that he's an idiot you know I, I know he's going to have to fix that I, the Lord had to come up with this phrase you can't fix stupid and you <laughs> press it on somebody to say it somewhere for that cause I'm sure he has said that more times you know uh, you know if he had a dollar for every time he had said that about me he could pave another fruit with gold I mean you know There are times that we that we do. What are some of the things we need to think about in order to try to hit it right and move in that sense so that God knows our heart and that he will be merciful to us rather than letting the natural chips fall where they may. And these four things that I mentioned, and finally, the fifth thing, which is important to think about when you have this plan, when you're making your plan, your scheme, what is plan B if plan A fails? If we feel we can't wait, we can't think, and we can't obey, and we have to act, what are you going to do if your plan fails? That answer may be the path you should travel to begin with. Naomi and Ruth didn't have a plan B. They didn't have a plan B. And we're going to see next week where Boaz throws a wrench into this thing that they should have thought about but didn't and didn't plan for. Thankfully, the providence of God did. But they didn't plan for it. If you're going to make a plan and a scheme, what are you going to do if it doesn't go like you want it? That may be the place you need to start in thinking about what you're going to do. Because the answer to that plan B might really be the plan A that you need to go with. See what I mean by that? I, might, I just think it's so funny because I'm really, 
I think there's a huge, I'm sitting here trying to realize going, there's a huge difference between a plan and a scheme. I never scheme. My thing is to be planning. You know, and, mm -hmm. and because that word just bothers me so much. Yeah, but, it does because we have to look at ourselves when we do that. I have a diagram in my head, I'm like, look, if it doesn't honor God, which hers didn't, I mean, all the danger, so then, mm -hmm. therefore it was a scheme. And then she went on, because she failed the <coughs> number one and number two. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. This was this Ruth. I mean, Naomi had a scheme. This was a scheme that she came up with. This it is truly the 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 grace of God through Boaz that this thing didn't blow all the pieces. This is the lineage of Christ. This is the lineage of Christ. He he understands us. He is tempted in all points like as we as he walked on this earth, and he also has the family tree to say, yeah. You got some bad genes in there. I understand that. <laughs> but he looked at her heart. I do agree. He knew, although we have questions about this woman, mm -hmm. he knew her intent, what what her intent was, which of course was to get rid of the husband. Yeah. But, but her heart wasn't all in the wrong place. She was just trying to do it the best way she knew how, which was awful. He knew his intent which helped him with her in him. Yeah. He understood her intent, but he knew what his intent was. And that's what helped and opened the door of the providences that really came into play that prevented this thing from just blowing It's a miracle that nothing bad happened. Oh, yeah, it is. If you think back to that is. situation, yeah. that's a miracle in itself that nothing bad happened yeah. that night. Because even after Boaz woke up, We'll talk about this next week. You know, he's facing a dilemma. He's saying, now don't, don't let anybody know that there was a woman here tonight. Because the gossip mill would have gone nuts on Boaz. Oh yeah, you thought you were so good to get it, didn't you? Mm -hmm. You had a woman there. Yeah, go and tell us nothing happened, Boaz. Yeah, we'll believe that. Go ahead and defend yourself. Boaz was rattled by this. He knew this was a scheme that was as loony as a tune, you know. Interesting, interesting, and it's after 20 after, so it's going to be even more interesting as you will. <laughs> so, see you next week. We'll talk. We'll talk some more about this and look at how Boaz come into play with all of this. Congratulations, Rachel, on graduation. Congratulations.